Okay, so we're gonna dive in. We're gonna talk about when, so a different different kind of hazard. So when you're when you're gonna need uh, specialized plans. So I'm, I call this sort of tradi traditional high hazard departments. So this these are um, areas that you'll encounter more in this in this scripted world, right? Um, so a little bit a little bit of structure behind it, but you're still doing things like flipping cars, right? Um, so yeah, go ahead. So a lot of the stuff that we're doing for the high hazard things. Um, we've been doing them for years and years. You have industry standards. OSHA doesn't like to think about things that are in front of cameras, in front of audiences. They don't want to. See, they they want us to have plans, but they're not going to ever write a plan for intentionally flipping a car with people in it. Okay, they're not going to write a plan for intentionally jumping off a building. Um, so they expect us to follow industry standards, standards that have been done over and over again. There are times that permits are required. Most of the reason for permits is not to get people's money. It's that somebody's going to sign their name that they understand the hazards. Uh, technically, if you go over 120 feet with a scaffolding, it has to be permitted in the state of California. And the only reason for that is that you are hiring people and you understand what the permit rules are, what the scaffold rules are. So when you're looking for these things, any of the stuff can require um, special training. It can require um, just extra meetings, extra um, identifications of what the problems are and why you would want to find experts to help you with it and uh, look for the other information for the industry standards. So yeah, so we're calling these, sorry, I'm going back and forth between, between the slides, but these are your non-routine shooting procedures, um, and you may need special permits, you may need to hire an expert, um, you may even need additional insurance. So these are some of the examples, and these are com commonly the topics, uh, among many others, that you'll find in the AMPTP safety bulletins that I think Matt may have already talked about, or if we haven't already. So um, just uh, we're, ways to work with all of these. And you're thinking you're looking at like diving operations, pyrotechnics, um, skydiving, a lot trains are all things that are very regulated within and, and how we use them. We have to still follow within regulations, but then like airbags um, is not, or how to deal with edged weapons or firearms. Firearms are getting a little bit goofy because of um, after 9-11, you have to be careful of giving a firearm, a prop firearm, to someone who's a suspected felon. And unfortunately, an awful lot of actors, because of their substance abuse issues, you can't give them that gun. They, you, so there's, there's things to be aware of that you, you need to understand these issues or have an expert hired that understands the, ex, the, uh, the problem. And we actually, um, through the PGA, we actually have done a couple um, panel sessions that address a couple of these. Um, we had experts come in from pyrotechnics. Um, we had a marine coordinator, a stunt coordinator. Um, we had experts uh, talking about working with infants and minors, um, in trains, planes, automobiles. These are all actually available on the safety initiative page uh, through the on the Producers Guild website. So there's we've, we've recorded all of them. So. Um, for you, if you wanted to have kind of a similar experience as you're having now, um, you could watch that those uh, se seminars as well at home. So. And even though it's not a specialty thing, but a, a drones are kind of a specialty thing, but one of the safety issues that you have to deal with drones or you have to deal with is transporting the batteries. And it's also going into cameras, is that certain batteries can't be put into luggage anymore. And how you transport and get those across the world can be an issue that you have to take care of. Oh, it's an issue. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think it's usually a long conversation because you're bringing cases that are literally full of lithiums, and there's no, there's nobody in the world that's running through an airport that's not going to pull you aside. It's usually okay with a long conversation, but it is, it's an issue. Yeah. Okay. I think one of the um, safety pass classes covers specifically that. Um, I think the A2 class actually covers that. So, and I think you guys were asking about a list of where the, cl the classes that you guys have access to. Um, in the most recent issue of the Produced by Magazine, um, I wrote an article uh, that is in there that lists them out. And you guys actually, um, you should have gotten an e-blast last week or a couple weeks ago that actually lists out the classes available and um, the, the link to, to go ahead and buy them. Can I just, yep. <coughs> Can I just bring a bit of perspective on stunts and special effects? Um, 
obviously there, there's a, a, a community of really top class stunt coordinators, special effects people out there who do amazing things. Um, I, I know talking to our colleagues uh, here uh, that there's the same issue though that we have uh, slightly, which is the qualifications and experience of all those guys is not immediately obvious and the registration and the licensing for you know it's it's quite complex and people quite rightly often you know the work on reputation and um and trust uh which are important things i think it's important those producer because when stunts and special effects do go wrong it tends to be the crew that get hurt not the stuntman or the special effects person uh, and often when they do go wrong, it goes back to my earlier point about people will say, oh, well, you know, I never thought that was going to work. So I think sometimes on a, on, a, on a set, there's a sort of deference given to the stunt corner, who obviously has to be in charge and he has to be uh, the person calling the shots. But sometimes there's a reluctance just to ask the obvious question, uh, which, which, I mean, the other aspect of this is quite often... Uh, it, it's all the setup is all fine provided the stunt goes to plan but it isn't all fine if the stunt doesn't go to plan and uh, often vehicles behave in funny ways in particular you know you turn a vehicle over you would everybody would think it would it would slide you know 20 feet it slides 60 feet um, things things change and our experience is there's, whilst there are sort of common standards and a lot of stunt guys will say this is what you need for X and Y, they're not laid down anyway. You go and say to a stunt guy, okay, you're going to do this fall 30 feet off a roof. How many boxes do you generally use for that? And, you know, the answer is, oh, well, I use this and he uses that. And that, that it's at least in our, in our part of the world, there's... A, to our minds, a slight lack of standardization and the science. And so, whilst not interfering with the experts and trusting them and making sure that, you know, they get the, the, the ability to do their job, I would in always encourage people just to ask the basic questions as well. You know, show me the science behind this. Uh, show me the calculation. Um, where does it come from? And that people are a bit uncomfortable with that, but I think um, it's it's definitely worth thinking about. You also can't be afraid. The crew can't be afraid to say something. Even a kind of a, a minor special effect is the evil electricity takes over a house and wants to kill mom, so it superheats the water heater, the electric water heater, and puts a magnetic uh, uh, force field around the um, shower stall and is gonna have the hot water come and kill the mother. So is this how a movie do you, I've seen? This is a movie, you probably haven't seen it. Okay. I don't watch scary movies. I'm not surprised, it's a very <laughs> complex story. Problem. Well, you actually, you've probably seen it many times. The evil electricity. So, so how, do you, how do you create steam for the actress to be, to be able to act like she's being burned to death? Well, you use CO2. So the grip crew, we were asked to take cribbing and a C-clamp and f close up the structure of the, the shower so the actor can fight against, against it to try and escape. And the key grip and I are looking at it and go, isn't CO2 something that displaces oxygen? That all of a sudden you're gonna fill this thing with that CO2 steam and the actress won't be able to breathe? At some point, those are stupid little things that you've got to consider. We ended up holding the, the enclosure closed, but as soon as, as, soon as she said a, a certain word, we were able to open it and get her into fresh air. But we weren't going we to close it in such a way that it was going to take minutes for her to get her out. So the stupid little things that you've got to think about. All right. Michael, talk to us about... Risk assessment. That's, this is the fun part. <laughs> it actually is. Um, er, everything that we've been talking about up to this point is, is can kind of prepare you to conduct a risk assessment. You know? So I guess the basic question is, what, what is the risk assessment? And essentially, it's you're, you're identifying what your exposures are and your hazards, and then what are the resulting risks if something weren't to go right? Um, 
it's important to know that that yes, you have insurance policies. Yes, your underwriters uh, for the insurance companies are asking questions about your production. What are you going to do? Where are you going to do it? And all that. Uh, that's an important piece in in the whole risk assessment process. Um, but understand, and I want to make a clear distinction: there is a big difference between insurance carrier questions and what kind of questions you're asking and answering um, as it as it pertains to developing a risk assessment. Um, you know, insurance carriers will ask, you know, for example, where are you doing your production? They want to know a location because um, based on that, there's different laws in the insurance world as to how to insure, how not to insure, um, what, it, what, from a legal jurisdiction standpoint, there are some countries that you cannot insure certain things for, for, for production companies or anybody else for that matter. That's totally separate. That's building your policy for, for the production. If you ask that same question on a risk assessment side, where are you at? It might be South Africa. Insurance companies don't really care that it's South Africa in the, in the context that it could be hot down there. That makes no difference on, on them issuing a policy. But from a risk assessment standpoint, it makes a huge difference on how you're going to um, operate your production. If it's hot weather, and we talked about it, California has the heat and cold uh, requirements under Cal OSHA that you've got to you know, provide water and breaks and shade and that sort of stuff. Um, does it still apply from an insurance standpoint in South Africa? Maybe not. Does it apply under a risk assessment mitigation plan? Absolutely it does apply. So understand there's a big difference. Just because the underwriters ask certain questions, it doesn't always um, help you develop your risk assessment and, and identifying what those exposures and hazards are um, for your production, okay? Um, so that's step number one is, is asking those questions and identifying what your exposures are, what your hazards are, all right? Um, <clears throat> and so up to this point when you develop your safety plan, you know, you understand what some of the risks are for the, for the again, back to that three-legged stool, where, where's our liability, how are we protecting our, our assets, our physical assets, and how are we protecting our people? That's a guideline to go down that list, right? So you ask well, what are what are exposures and you come up with a list of exposures and understand and I'm going to define a little bit better you know exposures are like I said earlier what can happen or what's present so if we're in a in the middle of a forest in the middle of August fire a forest fire is an exposure okay um, what's the risk of that exposure well with, for our people it's death if they get caught in a forest fire they're dead Right? So how do we go from knowing what the exposure is to mitigating that risk, preventing people from dying in a forest fire? That's the risk assessment. That's really it in a nutshell. Understanding where the exposure is and understanding what are we going to do to prevent bad things from happening to our people, our equipment, you know, or the location. Um, <clears throat> the goal of a risk assessment. Well, I mean, the goal is to is to protect. Um, it's really as Kent started off with. It's to send people home the the same way they came. It's to box up all your equipment the same way that it was unboxed. It's um, leaving the location, you know, from an environmental perspective, in uh, in an environmentally correct way. I mean, if you come in with a thousand people. On a, on, a, on, a, on a production and you trample the grassland, do you have to go back and mitigate that somehow? Um, even though that's not, a, that's not a, uh, a traumatic loss, it's still a loss nonetheless that you have to take into consideration and it, and it may be included in your risk assessment. You know, risk to the environment. And once we're done, we're gonna, we're gonna go back and re-veg the place and get it back to where it was. Um, but the goal, the goal of a risk assessment, or let me, let me back up just a minute. What I, what I don't think you guys need to, to go into a production with the mindset that, oh, we have an insurance policy, we're covered. That's not your risk management plan. That's not your safety plan. That's like way down the list on things that you should, you should have available to you um, 
and not at the top of the list. I think too often entities consider having an insurance policy as their fail safe. It's not. It's not. Um, it's all the other things. It's your safety plans. It's your safety program. It's your risk assessments. It's job hazard analysis. It's hiring the right people. It's using the right equipment for the right job. It's all of those other things. Then even if you go and do all that right and you still have a loss, now you can play with your insurance policy. It's not the first thing, it's the last thing, okay? So, so the goal of a risk assessment is to um, mitigate, uh, actually the ultimate goal is to eliminate any of those risks or any of those exposures that, that might be out there. It's impossible to do. You cannot 100% eliminate all the dangers that you might come across. Um, so what's the next best thing? Let's reduce that risk. Let's mitigate that risk through training, through, through engineering practices. Can we engineer out the exposure? You know, if it's a forest fire exposure, can you engineer that out? No, you can't prevent that unless, you know, if there's a no fire ban, then you don't have a campfire. I mean, that's one way of engineering it out. It's very simple. Um, Another way that you can engineer things out is that uh, if we're shooting on the edge of a cliff, can we put some barriers um, on the edge of that cliff to prevent people fall from falling off? Yeah, maybe we put up a, a guardrail or, or we load in a bunch of boulders just to block that edge. That's an engineering practice that you can, you can reduce that exposure. You can't eliminate it, but you can reduce it. So when you do this, when you build your risk assessment you start with the worst case and then the things and then you identify those things that you do to get to the point where you're comfortable and then you can move forward again it's the business decisions that you make are, are risk acceptance decisions every time to some level or another some people have a really high appetite for risk um, and they'll do things that are a little bit more dangerous I guess than than other than another person would have um, <clears throat> but can you live with it and then if you're doing that, does your policy respond to it? Do you have exclusions in your policies that say if you do this and something happens, you are not covered? And there's many, many things out there that, that will be excluded in your policies. But those, a lot of times those are negotiated points. And your risk assessment can help you negotiate that with, with your insurance carriers. If, if the underwriters can see that you are taking all reasonable steps and I, use the word reasonable purposefully, um, then they're more likely to, to write your policy because they feel comfortable with how you're operating things. So the risk assessment helps you tell the story to the carrier. Insurance risk assessments are a little different because they're coming from the insurance side to you and not from you back to the insurance side. Does that make sense to you? I, I know it's kind of confusing um, when we start talking about insurance and safety and all that, but you you got to sell your product to the insurance carriers at times you know and they may come out and say no we're not going to insure you because we don't like you know high hazard risks that you're you're about ready to embark upon but if you go and show them say yeah well we get it you know it's it's a high hazard but look what we've done and you tell your story and you show your training and you show that you're hiring the right people for the right job and you're using the right equipment for the right activity um, then they're more than they're more likely to to soften on their stance of an exclusion and provide you that coverage now I say that and the caveat being is that they will offer you that coverage at a price so um, know that going in and so I want to actually went on to the next one so they have the you know why are risk assessments important and I think we've you've kind of touched on that um, you know guys I some of this even was re-explained to me yesterday so I if you're confused, I understand because I thought I had it and then it was re-clarified to me. So feel free to jump in with questions for some of this um, if, if you have any. So. Yeah, this, I mean, you know, Paul will tell you, I mean, the UK, it's a requirement. Um, there's not anything that goes on in the UK that there is not a written piece of paper, a document that's a risk assessment. Um, in the US, it's not a requirement. Um, it's changing. More and more folks that I work with are, are now using risk assessments because uh, not only are they finding that risk assessments help provide a, a more safe work environment for, for everybody on the set, but they're also finding it as a good reference um, document so they don't forget to do certain things. 
and then you know a year from now when they go to a new production they're finding it also a good reference document that they can go back to and say oh yeah and in fact jared and i were just talking you know going down memory lane all these all these productions he's been involved with um just going through this discussion process and thought process he's remembering all these war stories and all the things that they had to go through uh, to get to where they're at today and you know the so the comment is the events create the change you know and none of this stuff that i think we're talking about from a safety perspective um is just comes out of the sky you know something happened somewhere down the road someone got injured someone got killed property got damaged and now the change is there so now we have knowledge and that's what we're trying to to help you folks understand is that um, again you don't know what you don't know so hopefully after today you know a little bit more than you didn't know before right and you now are able to ask some some kind of pointed questions that kind of get to what types of exposures that you need to be concerned about um, whereas yesterday you had no idea that you even had to think about it um, so that's what it's all about using your creative mind and and creating the scenarios that could possibly pop up and then figuring out a way to again balancing that with the creative figuring out a way to make it as safe as reasonably possible um, you cannot make everything 100 percent safe you can't other than stay in bed but even staying in bed has some risk <laughs> right <laughs> was was i'm oh, sorry question Go ahead. <laughs> Why is it got to be a woman? Well, <clears throat> that's a diff that's a tough question. It really is because I, I know the people that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I work with them too, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, hopefully you can appeal to their, to their sense of logic and common sense. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, I think it's worth a very serious sit-down conversation saying, well, you know, I'm not willing to risk my life because you want to get this shot. And, you know, and just and be blunt and be honest and be upfront and say, if you have a plan that we can work with or develop, then we're more than happy to do that. But at some point, again, it's back to what's your appetite for risk. If you're the guy out there making the decisions and you have somebody else in this ear saying, we're going to do it this way, you know, you're in charge. You know, so who is that go or no go decision maker? Is it the director? No. Maybe. But that's that's what I do. I mean, if if they're coming to me with an unreasonable situation, okay, I'm going to plan it out. I'm going to put every um, precaution I can in place and say, okay, here's your scenario. Is this scenario worth what it's going to cost to get you this shot how you want it, or do you want to shoot this the second half of the movie? You know, <laughs> something like that where they can actually see it and understand it, and you still might not get through to them, but you know, find out. Uh, have your support system, right? Who else is backing you up on this? Is your first AD on, on your side? Is your, is your key grip understanding? Are they working through it with you? And a lot of times, sometimes I'll, I mean, I, I usually work as a production manager, but I'll get the, so I'll get the producer on board and I'll say, look, okay, here's what we're dealing with. And I understand for the creative, we want to make sure that we're able to execute this and get the very best we can. But these are the precautions we have to take and that's the only way we can make this happen well and you take into account you know the laws that are out there you know the, the potential criminal impacts on you personally or the director you know just as long as you, you make them aware of all this stuff that's important conversation as document well. it and document yeah absolutely <laughs> document you know if you document things and i and i hate using the cya term because that's not what we're all about because we want to do things the right way for the right reasons and, and make sure everybody comes home safe. But if you have someone that's just being a bully, you know, are, are you willing to walk away? Are you willing to do what you have to do to, to change that bulliness, I guess? Not really a word, but you know what I mean? There's another question. Oh, yeah, I put the flow chart up, by the way. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh. because the director 
is a creative person, isn't part of the, the and that's one of the things I wanted to say is, um, at some point, the legal aspect of it comes down to who's the boss, who's, who's the person in charge. We had one of our members about 12 years ago was killed on a TV show. And it was before, the, this incident was one of the incidents that caused the Safety Pass program to get started. See, the and events create the change. Right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, unfortunately, there, there's a, com a, a comment that people use is, um, safety regulations are written in blood. Yeah. And it's a terrible thing to say, but it's unfortunately true. So because there wasn't any program, because there was nothing there, they, they'd done a scout. The scout included, um, putting up some scaffolding. The scaffolding was gonna go up against the edge of a piece of property, and four feet on the other side of that piece of property were high voltage lines. And the, the grip was electrocuted um, during that, that incident, and it went all the way up to where the, uh, the district attorney was threatening prosecution of the head of the studio, okay? Because they didn't have anything that was a little bit weird because there wasn't anything in place for doing the um, safety from the very top. Is now you've got things that where more stuff is going on. So in a situation like you were talking about, where you are dealing directly with a director who isn't in charge, is not in any way within that line, um, you're going to tell them no. They just they end up firing you and they do it anyway, and nothing happens. Now it looks like you were wrong. It's it's a tough situation to be in. You're, and I've been told by safety um, vice presidents of studios that they don't have the authority to stop production, and they dump it on the insurance guys. Is that they tell the they tell the director, we can't insure that stunt, we can't insure that action. My 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 take on this is um, having been the head of safety in a big broadcaster for a dozen years or so, and occasionally coming up with this kind of thing is that you need a corporate structure, even if you're even a small company, but you need a corporate structure where people can refer up. If you're the producer on a shoot with a very strong-minded director who's not much given to um, caring about people's safety, then there needs to be a mechanism whereby that producer can go to their managers, you know, to, the, to their senior people and say, listen, this guy wants to do this, that, and the other, and I don't think it's safe. And that's not, uh, you know, that sounds like a sort of cowardly way of approaching it, but actually often in corporate world, that's, that's how the thing works, right? Uh, but it requires the whole organization to say, you know, this is what we're gonna do. Now, it may be a discussion, maybe the director gets on to the boss that you've complained and they have a discussion and they decide that you're wrong. But, you know, you gotta stand by your views, right? Your judgments. Um, so it's, it's difficult, uh, but whenever, in my experience, we've had that situation, uh, by the time we've talked it through, we've either decided there's another way to do this which is safe, which will meet the director, some of the director's aspirations, or we're not going to do it. And, you know, the director's had the chance to say, well, you know, um, you're ruining my creative vision or whatever. But that the, the organization as a whole has made a collective decision, at least the key people in it. So there's, it's, about a, it's about working in a structure. Now that's tough if you're a small production company and you've hired a director and uh, he thinks he's running the show. I mean, that kind of stuff needs to be made clear up front, right? And, it, and it's tough. I mean, <clears throat> it, from a risk management standpoint, understand that risk managers, safety managers, those types of people, it's not, it's not our job to say yes or no to something. Um, it's our job to provide information so that a appropriate decision can be made. And again, business decisions are risk acceptance decisions. So at what level are you comfortable? And, and then you go from there. And I think, you know, Paul's right. If you have these conversations, um, I think ultimately logic kind of wins out. Common sense will win out. And, and the director should still get his shot, um, it may be modified. But at least you've had the conversation, so he's not going into the shot blind. He understands all the ramifications and all the consequences, which we haven't talked about. Um, but that's what risk assessments do. Identify the hazards, identify the exposures, mitigate the risks, 
but in between that you have to understand what what are the consequences if we go forward the way it stands today if you make changes and you mitigate and you put in pieces to to reduce that exposure then you still have to think about it what are the consequences now after we've made these changes because you're still going to have them right um, Jack asked the movie had insurance and had safety people <laughs> yeah no they do and you know and <clears throat> I've worked in the ski industry for a long 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 time and back in the early 70s mid 70s there was a, a guy that liked to jump off 80 foot 100 foot cliffs a guy named Scott Schmidt um, and I saw a, a little blurb on him one day and, and all we see on the on the movie the ski movies is is the 30 seconds that he jumps off and lands and skis away. But what you don't see, and he made a point of this, is that, hey, I he said, I'm up there three days before I do this thing, evaluating my run-in, my takeoff, my landing, the wind, the weather, the temperature, the wax on my skis, the connection with my bindings. So all of that, he's going through a risk assessment. That's what it's all about. And then, and then at the end of the day, you know, when it comes time to jump, He's the no go. He's the go no go guy. He can ski right up to the edge and stop, or he can go off. But someone has to be in that role, and and everybody within the production has to understand that. If you have fairly well developed risk assessments, it's much much easier to be the no or the go no go guy, or gal. Uh, if you don't have any of that information, then you're being this gentleman's director and you're acting from a blind position and you're making decisions based on no information which could put you your crew your actors um, all that stuff in jeopardy and that's and then you don't go home the way you came into work and that's not what we want to have happen so will you walk us through I, I bumped up to the kind of the flow chart slide but you explained those so well to me yesterday and I wanted to make sure that you did the same for this crowd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that made a lot more sense, so, and I, so I plugged it in like that. Yeah, so, you know, and we talked, we touched on a little bit earlier exposures and hazards and what they are and then what a risk is. I mean, essentially, exposures and hazards are, are things that are ever present in our, in our world today, you know. Um, right now, in this building, we, we have a roof collapse hazard. Is it going to happen? No, probably not. Could it happen? Absolutely. How is it going to happen? We don't know. So the exposure is a roof collapsing. The next thing you want to think about is what's the frequency of roofs collapsing in buildings in Los Angeles? Very, very, very small. What's the severity of a roof collapsing anywhere in Los Angeles? Severity is extremely high, especially with 40 people in a room. We're probably going to all get injured at some point. Some of us would die. So. That's the risk that we're taking, right? Exposure is the roof collapsing. The risk is that we could get injured or, or get killed. Um, <clears throat> so how do, you, how do you fix that? Well, engineering will tell you that an engineer, a structural engineer designed this building, should have designed it by code, had to write, had to sign his name to a document that says it's all up to speed, it's all up to code, our building processes were correct. You don't have to know what those codes are. You don't have to know what the proper way of construction is. All you know is the end result is that it's been engineer stamped, it's signed off, it's structurally sound, building department gave an occupancy permit and we're allowed to be in here. So and we can live with comfort knowing that this roof is not going to collapse. And also in this building, because in the state of California and as the evolution of worrying about earthquakes happened, this building was built to code but then had to be retrofitted since we've owned it to make it earthquake safe. So because a tilt-up building didn't have to have the roof connected to the walls, now they do, and this one ha has been done. Which is a great example of your risk assessment, you know? New information is available, we have to make adjustments in our assessments. So, and that's new processes, new people, new locations, new equipment, new laws. Mm -hmm. Anything that changes will change your assessments. You called it liquid, I think, yes, the other day. Yes, it's a li it's they're liquid. liquid documents. Yeah. Everything you do for safety is liquid. It never stands the test of time because things are frequently changing and 
and human element uh, makes that change happen more frequently sometimes than, than other times. Um, but hotels are, are a good example of severity and, and frequency. They have a lot of blips on their, on their, uh, on their radar screen of, of very minor insignificant incidents that happen at hotels. But statistics will tell you the more frequent you have the minor blips, eventually you're going to have the big one. So if you, on your production, if, you know, if you're monitoring the incidents that you have, and I, I meant to mention this earlier, but near misses are, are a, a critical piece of, of your analyzing what's going on, not just the actual injury incidents, but incidents that occur that could have hurt somebody but didn't. Those things need to be tracked, and it's a very tough thing to do because our staffs don't, don't report those to us. They just kind of go, wow, that was a close one, and they move on. Um, <clears throat> but as part of your assessment, you know, do you have a process in place for reporting accidents, for investigating accidents, for reporting near misses, investigating near misses? Um, because all that information that you can gather as part of your safety plan, your safety program, your risk assessments, um, that's all going to go into improving your culture and that's really what it's all about is what are we doing to create a, a strong safety culture within our organization within our production um, and how are we conveying that to everybody else so when you do risk assessments it's not a document that you fill out and you create and you file it's a document that you fill out you create and you share um, it's not a hidden document you want everybody on the set to know what they're exposed to and and you want everybody to know what you're doing to reduce that exposure and you also want them to know that if they have a, a better idea a different suggestion that they're able to come to you and say yeah hey what'd you think about this um, and you might say no I didn't but that's a great idea let's incorporate it so now we're changing our assessment again all right Does that help no no it's perfect and then I is there an answer to the question? Do you manage to the severity? Do you manage to the risk? Is there an answer to that? You, you manage to the risk because um, you could have an exposure that the risk is a broken finger. Is it severe? No. Not unless you're a concert pianist. It's not a, it's not a severe risk. If, um, but it's still a risk. So if we have exposures of broken fingers, do we want to do we want to assess for it? Absolutely. However, I say that the caveat being, is that a significant exposure that you need to worry about? Probably not. Probably not. Um, you know, so that that's a that's one where you wouldn't really manage to the severity, but you're managing to the risk. Now, I, if you manage to the severity, I think you 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 could essentially all you're doing is saying we're not going to do it because if you have something you're filming you know sharks in the water well what's the consequence of not being in a shark cage the diver with the camera gets eaten by the shark that's severe so you know are you going to manage to the potential of him getting eaten by the shark or the exposure of him getting eaten by the shark i'd rather manage to the exposure drop a cage in let him sit inside the cage and film instead of just having him free swim. Does that, does that kind of help clarify things a little bit? Yeah, because, wait, hang on, hang on. So I was <laughs> going to say before I turned my page. So this is, and tell me if I heard this wrong from you the other day, but um, you, you were basically saying, okay, what is exposure? Exposure can lead to risk. Exposure can lead to risk. And then exposure can cause an incident. I liked, I liked how you termed that, so I wanted to kind of repeat yeah, that. And so when you do risk assessments and you identify your exposures, they are what they are. You write them down. Exposure to our diver without a cage is, you know, or actually the exposure is we're sending a diver in with a camera to film sharks in the ocean. We know what the risks are like that. So, what, so now we're going to mitigate. So we're thinking worst case scenario, he's in there without a cage, he could get eaten. So how do we mitigate that? How do we eliminate it? Number one, you eliminate it by not even letting him in the water, which doesn't do you any good because that eliminates your production. So we can't, we can't eliminate the exposure. So what we can do is mitigate the exposure by dropping him in, in a shark cage. And so that's the end result. So now we take 
the frequency on on that type of an incident or that type of an exposure is probably without the cage the frequency could be uh you know if you if you scaled it on a one to five i don't even want to scale it if you go from a a low frequency moderate frequency or a high frequency that might be a moderate frequency of getting eaten by a shark of getting eaten by a shark getting without being a shark. in a cage if you put him in a cage and the severity is going to be very high so you put him in a cage the frequency is going to be low and the severity is probably going to go to low as well so do you see how that risk assessment helps you design that so if you look at it from an insurance perspective if i just showed them the assessment of we're going to send a diver in with no cage he's going to swim around with sharks and that's what we're going to do the insurance company is going to say what are you crazy we're not going to assure you for that that's ridiculous but now i show them here's what we're going to do to mitigate that oh you went from a moderate and high frequency and exposure stamp or standpoint or frequency and risk standpoint and now you've created this situation to where it's low and low yeah we can we can do that so that's where that risk assessment can help you tell the story to the to your carriers um, to get the coverage you're looking for for the things that you're trying to do jared have you been through an example of applying that <clears throat> yeah many risk assessments <laughs> I, I mean i think for us risk assessments are they are the tool to ensure s safety i mean yes they're also a tool to get network sign off and get insurance but they're a really valuable document to looking at you know it's checks and balances too you know we'll create a, a risk assessment then we'll run it by you know a separate risk assessment that the network is doing and we'll compare and contrast and they'll say your plan we were just in ivory coast in africa and we did a whole risk assessment for that. And you know, given these scenarios, these are our plans. If this doesn't work, this is what we're doing. If all goes wrong, these are where the nearest hospitals are. These are the quality of these hospitals. I mean, you literally go down to, you run through every scenario and making sure. Um, we had another one, we were in um, filming in Kabul, Afghanistan. And it was the same thing. What's your security if something goes wrong? And if your crew will want to ask these questions. I mean, it's the same thing you were saying. It's, it's, this isn't a document to be shared with the network or your insurance broker and then put away. It's a document that should be in every crew's production binder so that they also know those, you know, that sequence as well. It's, I mean, the risk assessment is a very valuable, very valuable tool. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen organizations actually attach them to the call sheets on a daily basis because they, like I said before, they're liquid, they change. Mm -hmm. um, so what's happening today um, is going to be could be different than what would happen tomorrow and the only way to do that is to communicate that I think it's quite an important point this because in our in our part of the world where these things are a requirement and therefore very common they can also become sort of quite bureaucratic and people can sort of treat them as just something that needs to be done that they don't use at all and, and that's partly because people overdo it frankly um, you know, the, the law, as far as we're concerned, actually says that you must make an assessment of the significant risks. Um, and significant risks are different in different contexts, right? But it doesn't mean that you have to produce 50 pages of stuff, you know, which, is, which covers almost everything that could, could happen. And, and the reason that we don't, as a company and as, as uh, uh, people who support this, and we don't like that is because nobody will read it, right? Nobody's got the time to read all that. And anyway, the thing, the important things that you want them to take away from that are buried in, on page 37, you know, um, and they spend ages wading through, uh, you know, make sure you put your sun cream on and one thing or another, which are all valid things. But frankly, you know, you need to leave the common sense stuff to people common sense. So you need to focus them in on the significant things. And it's important that they get shared and that people understand uh, you know, firstly, what the levels of risks are and what the hazards are, but also what you've said you're going to do about them. Because uh, in a lot of investigations, um, both of big accidents and, and low ones, what you find is the risk assessment was great. The risk assessment said we're going to, okay, speaking out of turn slightly, but we're going to we're going to build a prop which is you know a fast closing door on the on the uh, Millennium Falcon. And um, we're going to have a system whereby we make sure that Harrison Ford isn't standing under it when it closes. Okay, well, the fact is that they didn't have a system. They didn't do what they said they were going to do in the risk assessment. And so guess what? A million and a half pounds worth of fines <laughs> and lots of other l losses. So it's in some ways, and funnily enough, on a previous panel that I was on with Jen, the, the insurance 
gentleman did point out that uh, to have a risk assessment that says you're going to do things and then ignore it is sometimes worse than not having one. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if you're going to do this process, which is absolutely valid, and I would say for all the reasons that have been pointed out, is a useful planning tool, is, is a good way to, you know, talk to your insurers, um, does keep people safe. And I would add, in a culture like yours where it's quite legit litigious, and a lot of, especially minor stuff, gets settled. In the settlement negotiation, it's quite useful to be able to demonstrate to people that, you know, you did think about all this stuff and you did have controls in place. Um, so that's a, another useful uh, reason to have it. But you've got to make sure that it gets communicated and you do what you say you're going to do. Otherwise, you, I think you can leave yourself more exposed than, than otherwise. Well, and that goes for any document. You know, sure. you're developing your safety plans and, and, your, and your overall safety program. You put it down on, in black and white on a piece of paper, if you create policies, you've got to make sure you can live up to those policies. Don't paint yourself in a corner, um, as Paul said, in, in this litigious world that we live in, because it looks good on paper. I mean, I've seen documents and, you know, standard operating procedure manuals that say we will guarantee your safety and i look at that and i'm going well how much of a check do you want to write today because that's what's going to kill you that's someone's going to get injured a lawyer's going to get a hold of that and it's going to read we guarantee your safety you're writing a check and we we quite often see risk assessments where they're clearly written for the insurers and their executive management and the commissioners and the channel and they say, we will ensure every person has X, Y, and Z and does this. And you know damn well that that's not a practical thing to do on a production. And so actually you need to go back and say, come on, let's think of a sensible level of precaution here, which uh, everybody can buy into and which we can actually apply. So it's quite a, it gets to be quite a, uh, can, if you're not careful, get to be a convoluted thing, but the trick is to focus on the significant risks, the ones that are important, the things that are really going to hurt you uh, and hurt people, and make sure those are covered in a form that people can understand, can be easily communicated, and as you say, the relevant bits for each day's shooting can be taken out and stuck on the call sheet. Okay, remember today we're doing you know, a driving stunt, so these are the controls we're going to have in place. There's going to be nobody in front of the you know, cameras in front of the path of the vehicle or whatever the key controls are. They get communicated up front on that day at that time. And then if something does go wrong and the question's asked, you know, how did people understand how this was going to work? You, you've, you've got the evidence to show them. And this, uh, and this is an example. Actually, Paul helped create that, <laughs> not created that. They found this out yesterday. And I found, it, I found it on the internet. Uh, I don't want know? to take authorship of this. Where, <laughs> you know, us safe, safety people are all into R&D, you know, rip off and duplicate. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, th so this is a, can I just, just say something about this form? So this, this, this is the front of, a risk as of, of the standard UK risk assessment form. They come in various shapes and sizes, but this is, this is one that's very familiar to me from the BBC. And the BBC being a publicly owned organisation makes everything public, so you're not really ripping it off. It's <laughs> <laughs> available. Um, but the important bit is on the next page, of course, which where it says, what oh. are your hazards? Sorry. No, no, it's fine. I mean, I think that's fine because what this is, is uh, I don't know how much detail you can see on that, but obviously there's a bit at the top that just talks about the production, who's in charge, all that kind well, of stuff. Well, and just real quick, uh, this isn't a, a bigger handout that uh, Michael sent me. I'm going to make it available yeah. to you guys online. So you guys, will, it's actually like a 17 page document. So it, and you, I know you probably can't see it, but I'll make the whole document available to you. So you And then it. there's a handy sort of table of uh, the various sort of has common hazards in production. Um, and we, will, um, we actually have an online version of this, which you're, I'm very happy to supply you details of, where you just tick the hazards and it, that, it automatically populates what's, what the control should be. Um, cool. So the, our terminology is the hazard exactly, as, as Michael has explained, are the things that can cause harm. Um, and the risk is the... Is the, the the, the multiple of that hazard against the severity and the likelihood that's the level, that's the risk which is what that table sort of indicates at the bottom um, but on the next page you list the hazards if you've ticked you know I can't really read them but if you've ticked stunts or whatever then you say okay we're going to do a stunt as a vehicle stunt you identify typically you know what could happen who could be hurt and then you put in the important thing which is the control in our terminology or the the, the mitigation 
you know, what you're going to do to reduce the risk to a reasonable level. And that's the bit, of course, that is important that everybody needs to know. Um, and then you fill out the table like that. What you don't want to do is end up with 50 pages, though, right? which, as I say, deal with all the, all the, all the NIFNAF um, and focus on the, on the key things. And then those controls are the important things, which are the ones you've got to do. We're not going to let Harrison Ford stand under the door <laughs> when it closes. <laughs> Well, and, and, and look at this as a, as a piece of the puzzle. I mean, it started with we have a program, safety program. Now, within that safety program, we create safety plans, might have multiple safety plans, as Kent pointed out. Um, and within those safety plans, now we can dive down into specific risk assessments. So you don't need to include everything that's in your safety program in the risk assessment. In fact, I did, I did one event... Um, a couple years ago where we did I think one production there was 12 risk assessments so the reason we did that is because there was enough differentiations between the activities going on that um, it made more sense to break it down into kind of towers of risk assessments so you can if I put them all together in one giant one it would have been that 50 page document that Paul talked about but breaking it down to 12 risk assessments, I think the longest one I had was four pages. And that was, I think, just one. Hmm. So it makes it easier. So now we have the risk assessments available to the people that they apply to instead of the entire production. So if we're talking about stunts and it's a car stunt, we're gonna flip a car, maybe that's one risk assessment just on the car flip. So that the people involved in, in that stunt are the ones, they're getting the direct information right now, right today instead of having to weed through 50 pages to try to figure out what applies to them and doesn't apply to them. You had a question? As, as producer, there's two very simple things that um, you can do to CYA as you said, and then there's the safety That's good. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, yes. I gr no, absolutely, absolutely endorse that. The simpler and leaner and less time-consuming these processes are, the more effective they are. And going back to this form, which looks a bit sort of daunting, when I, when I ran safety in the BBC, for instance, and, and to some extent now, most of the common activities, common production activities, were covered by risk assess generic risk assessments that we, we termed them. Which basically say, you know, if you're going out, especially, you know, if you're in daily news, you're not going to write a risk assessment every time you go out to interview somebody on the street about the latest thing or you do a piece to camera from, you know, outside parliament or whatever. Y y y nobody's going to write a risk assessment every day, every time you do that. Um, so that gets, that's all covered. And as long as your people are trained, uh, the analogy that I like to use on that is if you go to a well run factory in Europe and you talk to, um, you talk to a lady on the production line, perhaps she's packing boxes or doing something, some part of the process, and you say to her, what does the risk assessment say about your job? She'll look at you blankly. She'll say, what the hell are you on about? But if you say in a well-run factory, what do you need to do to keep yourself safe in this job? She'll say, oh, well, you know, I have to make sure I don't have any jewelry that gets caught in this, and I don't have to make sure I don't put my hand in there without that switch being, whatever it is. And the same can apply. You can have a generic risk assessment, which covers your standard activities. As long as your people are trained and they behave in the right way, you're applying it. And that, that's a good process to have because it means you don't have to have those 49 pages when actually what you're interested in is the car you're going to flip that day or the you know, guy you're going to throw off a roof in a ball of flame or whatever it is you're going to do um, to, to, to cut the thing down. So it, it, it's a useful process and tool, but it can be... It can become bureaucratic if you don't manage it, and um, there are, but there are ways around that. And don't and don't think and don't think about details in this risk assessment. I mean, ideally, all the really minute details are included in your plans that you've developed or your program that you've developed. So it's a reference point. So when I say, you know, <clears throat> what are we going to do to mitigate, you know, getting chemicals in my eyes? I'm going to wear safety goggles. You know, so in the risk assessment, I r might write, 
you know, employee staff trained and will wear proper PPE. It's as simple as that. That's our mitigation right there. Um, we don't have to go into the, the, the real deep dive details of what kind of goggles are they going to wear, when were they trained, who trained them. That's all stuff that we already have in place someplace else. So very generic and very brief. Um, it's just more of a reminder, more of a resource document that, that as you're out there on the production sets that you can look at and say, oh, yeah, we, gotta, we have to pay attention now. Okay? Yeah. So um, use, it, use it as a tool. It's a, it's a, again, it, these are liquid documents too because, you know, if something changes, you've got to change these. So even though if you might develop these generic risk assessments, um, you have to monitor them, you have to review them every now and then just to make sure that they're still applying to the, to the exposures and the hazards that are out there that you're dealing with. I would just add one thing, especially for the unscripted world. A lot of times these risk assessments are made by the non-creatives. And it's so important that they are part of creating these documents because it's, you know, how are we going to execute this scenario given the, given the risks? And so that's something that we do a lot. It's, in the scripted, it sounds like it happens a lot, especially with stunts and such. But in unscripted, <coughs> more often than not, they're, they're not created in, in harmony with each other. And that's so important. And there's a little bit of a balancing act that you also have to deal with because having these generic processes and and being able to go and redo it over and over again is important. But you ha still have to read what's being put down and make sure that it does apply. When the Deepwater Horizon accident occurred, the company, the BP, had taken their risk assessments from the polar area where they drilled for uh, oil and applied that to the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So in there, it said that they had, you know, how to deal with polar bears and whales, which obviously doesn't deal with the, the, the Gulf of Mexico, and they were criticized that they had just grabbed and took this boilerplate information and put it in place. So there are times where even um, one of the studios had been uh, inspected and they got fined for not having a proper IIPP because they weren't ever uh, disciplining any of their workers for... Uh, safety violations. It was one of the major studios that has, you know, thousands of employees. They should be disciplining somebody for not wearing their safety goggles, for not wearing or following the rules. So at some point, you, it's great to have the the um, boilerplate, but you have to follow the plan as well, execute the plan as well. And if it's not working for you, you got to change it. Right. You know, and I, it's like oh, it's like if you get a new job and you move into a new office. I don't know if any of you have ever done it, but the desk is there and the phone is over here on the left and the computer's right here and you don't change it, do you? But you're right-handed, so now you're reaching over for the phone all the time over here. Well, why not move the phone over here? You can do that. So you can change these things as well. Okay, so I would have moved the phone. Huh? I would have moved the phone. That would <laughs> Most people don't. And then they go, I don't know why I have a crick in my neck. Talk to us about the relationship with the uh, insurance broker, and between insurance broker and production. Yeah, we're on your team. Um, you know, as a broker, we're the middleman, you know. So we're the broker that goes out and finds the product, the insurance product for your production. Um, we're your advocates. We're the liaison between the production and the carriers. We're on your team to support you and provide advice, consultation, answer questions, whatever. So when you, when you look at, at any of this stuff from a safety perspective, don't forget about the brokers. And even to, to a certain extent, don't even forget about the insurance carriers. If you call and ask a question, um, as a broker, we're going to have your best interest in heart. As a carrier, that's a little more subjective because they're in the business to make money and, and obviously they don't want to have claims but sometimes their loss control folks might be a little over the top and, and, and don't quite understand what you're doing or how you're doing it so you have to convince them but if you, if you go through the process of, of telling your story through the risk assessments through your safety programming um, up front then oftentimes they're going to be on your side as well. So uh, just understand that, that, that there's a resource out there that you shouldn't be afraid of, that you should be able to pick up the phone and call and say, hey, here's what we got going on. What do you think? You know? So please do that. Um, there was another note. Oh, just the note about, uh, you know, uh, 
shows are constantly changing and evolving and the insurance needs today weren't the same that were needed 10, 20 years ago. So, you know, having that relationship with your broker, explaining here's the new thing that we're trying to do so that they can help convey that to the underwriter. But, the, you know, I think in me, I, when I first started, there was always I was always nervous. Oh, I don't want to call insurance. I don't know. Then they're going to charge me more and it's just bad. I should just kind of glaze over it a little bit. No, they're your friend. You want to make sure they have a clear understanding of what your project is, what you're doing, um, what, you, what you really are trying to do, and let them help you. Let them help you put precautions in place. There are a lot of times are really, really great resources. They can help provide some of those resources and for in, you. And invite them to your production. Invite them to the set if it's possible so they can, you know, personally see the good things that you're doing and how you operate um, that believe me that sticks in their head the next time you call them up and say hey we got a new production we need coverage because you're not going out there to inspect anything no you're just trying to understand what no. it is that you're, they're doing that's right so and you know from my perspective when i go on to a set or or, or an event or or an activity um you know again i'm not the guy that says do this and don't do that uh, what i'm trying to provide are options low cost, no cost options that will make your operation more safe, less exposures, and based on experience, you know, coming from other, see, I can apply, I can apply a lot of stuff that comes from other industries into your industry. Um, you guys are kind of pigeonholed into what you do. I'm not, I, I do all kinds of different things um, in the entertainment and recreation world. So there are experiences that I've, I've been involved with that I can come onto your set and say, oh, you know what? I know this, this, was, this was a golf event, but here's what we saw happening there, and here's the same or similar situation that you've got. So providing some of that, that um, background experience to help give you an idea of some of the things and some of the options that you could probably put into play. Maybe not, you know, but it's worth the conversation. And, and again, back to what's your appetite, you know? If you're not worried about it, then I'm not worried about it. It's also something that we're not as unusual as we want to think. There's an awful lot of stuff that, you know, we use ladders the same way most other people use ladders and hammers and yeah. that type of stuff. Yeah, well, in the world of safety, in the world of, of risk assessments and, and risk management, um, it's all the same. Just different industries have different nomenclature and different language that they use, but you can weed through that and you can make that translation. You'll find, as Kent pointed out, what you do is the same thing that ski resorts do believe it or not, honestly. <laughs> exactly. So um, a couple of things I just wanted to point out and then um, we'll, we'll jump on. But um, how many of you guys have actually had to imply, apply for insurance coverage and fill out the, all the paperwork and everything? So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm choking. Um, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> um, a couple of things I wanted to point out just that I thought were interesting, you know, you go through and you're like, okay, let me fill this out and this, but why are they really asking me this? And okay, well, why, all right, I'll fill all this out. And uh, a couple of key things that I thought were interesting um, that, that became apparent in one of our other programs was, uh, you know, they're asking you, okay, well, who's, who's making the project, right? What is their, what is their history? Because that's what the insurance company is looking for. Like, what is their work history? What, what have they done in the past? Um, have they, do they have a, a lot of incidents in their past because they haven't taken the right, right precautions? Um, and then the funding source I thought was interesting, and I just lost Jared, but, you know, uh, I guess, Paul, maybe you had mentioned that, you know, do you have a controversial uh, funding source that could cause negative attention? And I, I never would have thought of that. I thought, oh, well, that's okay. And, that's, and that could uh, cause maybe someone to keep an extra eye out for your production, maybe come after you or, you know, that kind of thing. So maybe that's an additional precaution to take. Yeah, take look underwriters at. look at all kinds of stuff. They look at your loss history, you know, as an organization, not as a production, but as an organization. It could be, a, you know, a circus production on this side and a, you know, symphony production on the other side. Two diametrically different activities. But yet, if the organ overall umbrella organization has a loss history that's um, not so positive, it's going to be you're going to pay for your coverage more than you would be if if you had a good loss history. So, you know, understanding what your loss history is, understanding, you know, the acts that you have. You know, do you, are you hiring controversial actors and actresses and performers? Um, you know, Jen mentioned the funding mechanism. Um, you know, are you, I mean, you can see it nowadays with, with the NRA and, and numbers of organizations that are pulling their support from NRA because they don't want to be connected. 
So if your production's connected with a, with a controversial organization, how is that going to affect your reputation, which is, a, which is a, an assessment that you need to make, because that could be a loss. That's a loss. Your reputational loss is, is very important to you. Um, it's not something that can be corrected over, over a couple of months. That's something that's going to last forever or for a long time anyway. So, you know, that's why you, when you throw the net over all the exposures, you can't, it's not just about injuries. It's about the, um, the reputation, your, um, you know, the environment, the equipment, the people, all that stuff that we've been talking about. It's, so be wide with your questions. Be wide with your search and your research um, so that you can help ad address those with, with your with your insurance brokers, your insurance carriers. Like I said, invite them to come see your operation so that they have a very firsthand um, knowledge of what you do and how you do it. Um, communicate, it's really that simple. And then, as you pointed out, document stuff. Document what you do, how you do it, when you do it, um, and, and keep it on file. Okay. Paul, you wanna come up here and take us through yours? So I can do it from up there? Well, Talk whatever you want to do. We can try the remote, or you, I think That's you wanted okay. to come up here. You so. Give you a slightly different look. <laughs> people are... Much better. <coughs> oh, dear. People are... It's a bit, a bit lower this, actually. So I sense that um, energy level might be flagging a little in the room as we run towards lunch. Um, so I'll try and uh, bounce through this a bit. Jen uh, asked me to talk a little bit about what we term high risk. I suppose in the program, I think it says high hazards. Uh, it's, it's the same sort of thing. I'll, t I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I mean. But also, obviously, Jared has got a huge experience in this. And so we'll try and do a, I'll try and uh, refer to, to him to, to give some examples, one thing and another. Um, just to say, so First Option Safety Group is, uh, is, 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 you don't really, I don't think, have an equivalent here. We're a uh, consultancy, essentially, that supports independent TV and film production. Uh, actually, we do quite a lot of work in the UK and Europe for the studios as well. Um, mainly, the bulk of our stuff is, uh, as we've been discussing, it's, it's scripted, it's drama, it's entertainment, it's events, sports, um, coverage, all that kind of stuff. But we also do what we term high risk, which is the more non-scripted, factual um, news deployments into challenging places and non-challenging subjects. So I'll just talk a little bit about the safety approach to that. Um, why would you uh, listen to me on this subject at all? Well. Uh, uh, prob I think the reason that I can probably give some perspective on this is I spent a dozen years as the head of safety in the BBC. I was first uh, head of uh, what they call head of high risk, which was advising on news primarily, but also factual program makers going off to, at that time, of course, Iraq, Afghanistan was, was huge, you know, tsunamis, uh, um, earthquakes, uh, all, all the kinds of things that um, that program makers do. And, and through that period, and we were coming out of uh, previously the Balkans, and it was the, there was a news gathering in particular with satellite technology had developed, people were much closer to the action. And it was at the time when uh, the big broadcasters in particular, uh, but others started to develop these processes and policies. And so along with other colleagues, uh, both within the BBC and I, I was quite instrumental in developing what are now, particularly in the UK and Europe, um, but actually adopted by a lot of the US uh, broadcasters too, this sort of approach to this kind of, this kind of work. And by high risk in the context of media, uh, really just what, what we tend to mean, rather than the specialist stuff like stunts and, um, and, and special effects and that kind of thing which we were just discussing, this is more that sort of non-scripted, in dangerous places, dangerous groups, um, or responding to natural phenomena, natural disasters, diseases, all that kind of thing, which require perhaps a little bit more uh, planning and attention. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and I'm also going to talk just to talk about, you know, nothing ever stands still. So uh, I'll talk about the way this sort of thing is changing um, as we go through. So just in terms of trying to define, obviously, if you're going to 
build a policy and a process around how you do things. You need to define what it is you're talking about. So this is the sort of broadly accepted definition, um, which is that high risk is, has a significantly higher than normal risk of death or serious injury arising from um, really three areas. Hostile environments, as they're known, which are places where there are wars or insurrection, uh, turbulence, uh, public disorder of a certain degree. Normally, you, you'll find these on the State Department website in your case, or um, in our case, from Commonwealth Office, or any security provider will give you a map of the world, which is variously colored red, amber, green, um, showing you where, you know, where the places are which are particularly difficult. Um, High-risk activities, and these are things such as um, investigations into dangerous or dangerous groups, drugs, gangs, organized crime, um, undercover reporting in prisons, all that kind of uh, kind of stuff, which obviously doesn't have to take place in a hostile environment, but in an, in and of itself presents high risk. Um, and then high-risk events. And these are things that occur not in hostile environments and aren't part of um, uh, uh, dangerous activities, but uh, in themselves present high hazards. So natural disasters is the first one that comes to mind. Epidemics, you know, we recently, a couple of years ago, you will have heard of the um, Ebola crisis. Uh, very difficult so the story to cover for news teams, you know, highly, um, highly contagious and infectious and, and deadly disease. So how do you, how do you get in place procedures to do that um, with a lot of difficulty, I can tell you, but you, we, you, you can do it. Um, so high-risk events, uh, natural disasters, that kind of thing. So just a quick overview of, of the sort of corporate policies and processes which um, you might want to put in place if you're doing this kind of work at, at, at a very sort of high level. Um, I mean, the first thing is these, we've talked a bit about risk assessment just previously, and, um, and, and I, I talked about how a lot of standard activity can be covered by sort of generic risk assessments and training and that kind of thing. This is an area where you definitely want to get into the specific risk assessment. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, this will typically warrant an in-depth look at the situation in the place you're going to, the kinds of threats you're, you're facing, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how you do that, because that's quite a challenge, um, and working out, uh, you, you know, what is the residual, or what are the controls you can put in place to minimize those risks, and what is that residual risk? Because part of this process is, when you get into this level of risk, is trying to get a, a, a system whereby you balance up the level of risk you're going to expose yourself to for the benefit, you know, what it, there's always a risk-benefit discussion here. So what is, the, what is the editorial ambition here? What is the output that we're going to get? Is it worth that level of risk? Uh, organizations, particularly news organizations, are always making that, that choice. Clearly, if you're going to do this kind of thing, you, you, you're going to need some contingency planning. You're going to need to know what we're going to do if somebody gets hurt. What are we going to do if people get caught up in unrest, what are we going to do if people get detained, kidnapped, um, etc. So there's a, a, a bunch of contingency plans that need to be put in place. Um, you're going to want to make sure that the people who are doing this have had the necessary training and experience. Uh, that Those two things are often confused. We, we run for a number of the big news organizations, um, I think called the Hostile Environment Training Course. Uh, where we take bunches of journalists and we put them through a, a week of um, dealing with environments, teaching them a lot of medical training, a lot of trauma, but also security stuff. Uh, they come out of it at the end with a ticket, right? And it's, I've done the hostile environment course, I've done a week. And so now I can go to Mosul and cover the battle. No, <laughs> you know, you need to match up also, not just the training, a week's training, but you need to match up, you know, what people's experience is, how they're going to cope with this kind of thing, both as individuals and as a team. You know, what's the mix of experience you have in a team? And Jared, I'm sure you can talk to us a bit about that. Oh, certainly. Time. Like when we're looking to bring on, if it's not us going on a shoot and doing it, we'll 
very rarely hire a crew that has not worked together before yeah in these hostile true. environments because there is you know i think in any crew whether it's hostile or not there's an unspoken way that you work there's an unspoken way that you move together and that being able to anticipate and trust the people that you're in if you have one person that is the a wrong personality for a situation it can put everybody in danger um and so when you're looking at these whether it's the hostile environment is is war or whether it is um, weather related it's trying to find those groups that have worked together before is really essential um, and I think the right personality too you don't want somebody who is out there for that they just want this wild experience that is a real liability out there for everybody and a lot of those people exist and they're the just the ones that that Paul's talking about that'll get that ticket and then they just want to go in there and and have fun and, and creatively it's the same way we were in Afghanistan um, 2012 and 2013 and one of the units we are embedded with basically there um, it was right when the United States handed everything back over to the Afghans and being in Afghanistan we had a lot of embed opportunities and working with the network okay how are we going to pivot this you know what are what are story opportunities that don't involve us having to step on an IED to have a story that we can tell like how do we evaluate the risk and reward if we can guarantee a story coming back that the broadcaster is going to be excited about, but not one that necessarily puts us, you know, if we don't have that IED go off or if we don't experience gunfire, we don't have a story. So, um, any, but the team and who you're hiring and who you're bringing in is essential. So the next uh, item is equipment. You will want to make sure that teams are properly equipped. Um, so if you're going to a war zone, you know, you need the protective, you know, flak jacket, the ballistic jacket, helmets, medical packs, maybe riot gear, maybe protective clothing for any um, chemical hazards or, or biological hazards, all that, all that kind of stuff which has, which has to be factored in. Um, and then often, and I'm talking to sizable organizations, there's, there's a process by which we, we do all this planning and we have a look at, you know, how risky this is and what we're going to get uh, by way of output from it and we have some sort of approval process and some sign off and somebody says yep I think this is a worthwhile risk to, to take. And that can also impact the design of how you're filming something and we did another example is we did a sh uh, another project where on a, on a it was basically like a a pararescue men basically in, in Afghanistan where they could not give us necessarily commitment that, that we go on every mission with them because some might be too dangerous. And so instead of putting somebody on that helicopter and having to take that time and put their mission at risk, we changed our creative com completely and went to a fully mounted camera system. We had 40 cameras mounted inside and out that we would roll beforehand so we didn't have a person in their way, you know, putting their mission at risk, putting them at risk. Um, and you know, that limitation created a unique creative solution that gave the, the program a unique look to it. So, you know, I think it's also looking at the cameras, the equipment, but also looking at those limitations as an opportunity to do something that's a little special, different. And that's a great example of engineering out the exposure right there. <laughs> uh, just a little deeper dive into risk assessment. Now you've heard this, uh, uh, this phrase a lot today, but um, in the context of, of high risk, uh, so starting off with, as I mentioned, sort of detailed threat analysis, and, and I, I guess what I want to say about this is, you know, where do you get this information from? You can go to all sorts of websites, you can get, you know, you can get a report about a country, but in these, in these circumstances, you need really detailed, granular, up-to-date information if you're going to make any sort of sensible plan, and where, and where do you get that? Interestingly, we had a meeting with Netflix earlier this week where we were talking exactly about this. Um, you know, they were saying, don't send us a, the sort of G4S, you know, standard report on a country. Uh, that, that's no good to us for program planning. We need to be able to get right into the details. So that normally means, you know, you need people on the ground that you trust. Uh, you need fixers, as they were, Gerald referred to. You need uh, local authorities, contacts, that, so that you can get the up to, mi up to the date, up to the minute picture. And you need to, what, what we term, triangulate that, because you don't just want to go to one source. Inevitably, there's a commercial aspect here. These people are looking at a big paycheck if they're going to help you out on this production. So they might be tempted to sort of spin it a little bit and just soften the words. So you want to make sure that you're triangulating your information and getting it from a number of sources so you do get the actual picture. 
And then you need to look at how you're going to how you're going to deal with the, all the significant risks that could have been it could be any of those things: bombs and bullets, violence and crime, detention, kidnap, etc. Um, infrastructure, environmental ha hazards. You know, in a lot of these a lot of these places, uh, actually, the, the, the you know there may be a, it may be a sort of war zone, but it might be quiet. And then actually, the highest risk is from the fact that the whole infrastructure of the country is shot, that the water isn't contaminated, that the uh, sanitation doesn't work, that there's no electricity um, anymore, and th those can be significant hazards. Travel safety, always a key uh, problem. How are you going to move? What vehicles are you going to get? Or what aircraft, what boats, whatever. Um, the point that Jared made, uh, the local, if you're hiring local drivers, how good are they? How can you, can you control them? More people get hurt in hostile environments, in road accidents, than in anything else. So that's always a, 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 a major one. Extreme environments, we've talked about weather, and Jared's talked a lot about the extreme cold and heat. They obviously need to be taken into account. And CBRN stands for Chemical, Biological, Radio, Radiological, and Nuclear Hazards. Um, we're supporting a very interesting production right now, actually, which is uh, doing a piece about the decaying um, uh, it, it's actually related to Chernobyl uh, coming up. I think we're on a, coming up to an anniversary of Chernobyl and um, uh, about similar uh, former Soviet and now East, Eastern Bloc, if you want to call it that, um, chemical plants and the hazards that they're proposing. And the crew are going into all sorts of uh, difficult industrial situations, you know, they've got all these decaying plants with all sorts of chemical hazards around the place, so there's training and equipment and, and all, and knowing how to recognize the signs and symptoms of things and all that kind of stuff. Um, travel health, that's always going to be an issue, uh, uh, of course, wherever you're going, vaccinations, all that kind of thing um, needs to be thought about, and, and of course, along with contingency planning, what are you going to do um, if somebody gets hurt? Communications and ex external support, I, I put this, v absolutely vital on these things and quite difficult, is how are you going to stay in touch with your team and how's that collective decision making going to be made, you know, because this, whatever plans you've made, and I'm sure Jared will back me up here, will not survive the first day in country. Minute. Uh, <laughs> minute in country. <laughs> so there'll be changes. It'll be, well, actually, we were going to go to this village and interview these people, but they've moved to that village and we're going to go there. What's that situation like? How are we going to get there? All that kind of thing. What does that involve? Do we need, ha do we need to refer back to base to, to sort of get that signed off? And all that kind of thing. And that all requires communications, which are often difficult in countries um, that are challenging, right? Uh, and also... You know, if things uh, if things are changing and things are uh, need discussion, how is that going to be supported from outside the outside the area? Um, we've just had we've been in situations where we've been in the middle of the shoot and we've heard of a potential coup coming in. And so, what do you and so how does the production shift when we know that this country could implode? You know, do we and then basically what you just to Paul's point is to have have an out plan. It, we didn't have to use it. We didn't have to. To, to do it, but we had, I mean, a huge production, almost two, three hundred people that we had a, a, a clear plan of how we were going to get everybody out by boat if that, if we were going to get close to that. And we came very, very close to it, but we ran through those scenarios. Basically, we got the intel before it even was news. Um, and so having those people on the ground that you can trust that are just have the ear of what's happening um, is just so key, so key. Because if it's, you're too late, you're too late and you're stuck because that country will go into pandemonium and there'll be no way to get out. And the final bullet point there, protective equipment, we've talked about, so I won't labor it. But just to sort of wrap, the, wrap this up to say, uh, on the other one, the last one was information and communication security, which comes back to communication a little bit. But the point about, I think what's important about this is that you, you definitely, this is a case where you have to focus on what are the significant risks. That has to be a discussion with the whole team. People need to understand it. Um, and, and I think there needs, the, where this goes off the rails is uh, where there are differences of expectation in crews. I'm sure Jared will be able to give his expectation, but particularly <coughs> if you've got some on-air talent. You know, the important thing for them is that they're, they're sending their report while the shots are going over their head. They, they love all that. Um, 
But often in those circumstances, you need to ask yourself, you know, how much more are we getting for the risk that we're taking? What do we really need to do to tell this story? And the fact that we put ourselves in uh, significantly more danger, how much is that adding to our, our program, to, to our production? How much is that adding to our piece? And those sort of balances, because we, su we support quite a lot of this stuff and, and uh, I'll, t I'll t tell the story. I don't think they would be embarrassed by me telling this, but um, they were in, uh, in Syria up with the Kurds wanting to do a piece about Syrian fighter, uh, Kurdish fighters fighting ISIS, um, including a lot of women who were uh, in the Kurdish army on the front line. And they'd arranged to be taken to the front line uh, to meet a local commander and film the action. And they, Julie, were taken up, <coughs> went, went to this village, and it was great. They met this commander who was, you know, big Kurdish, good-looking, action figure with a radio in his hand striding about. There was lots of incoming sniper fire. It was, they were getting shots of it bouncing off the walls behind them, but they were relatively safe in that position. Um, there was, it was quite well protected. They were you know, behind some hard cover and they were able to do their piece and all the rest of it. And then the Kurdish commanders, as is often the case, they said, look, let's go forward. We'll take you right forward to somewhere else, to the, to the next position in the village. So they you know, I think thought about this and decided, yeah, okay, we'll go forward. Uh, anyway, to cut the story short, you know, they ended up in, in another position where, frankly, it was more of the same. It was more shots coming in and bouncing off the wall behind it. Televisually, it was more of the same. But in order to get there, they'd had to <coughs> run across open ground, be shot at, dive into ditches. You know, the level of risk that they'd taken to get this extra something was, was not really justified. They didn't really get any more from going to and And afterwards, they, they all sort of, you know, reviewed it and thought, yeah, I mean, that, you know, we didn't really get anything out of that and it would have been good to have that conversation before they did it. They were all fine. Um, cameraman who had to run with all his gear was uh, not best pleased, but, um, you know, they, they all survived. But it's just a, an example that I use uh, because <coughs> often, often you find that that situation um, presents itself. Um, <coughs> yeah, key things about hostile environments, conflict zones, up-to-date information. You've done your research, you know about the threat, but how, you know, often in these situations the, the, the threat is changing hourly, if, if not, you know, certainly daily. The village that was secure, the road that was secure, yesterday is it secure today how are you going to know where are you going to get the information from can you trust the people who are who are leading you around they've as i say often got a they want to do a good job they want to get you uh what you need um so they're likely to say yeah yeah it'll be fine you know let's let's go down there but how do you validate that and how do you how do you um make sure that you're not getting into more more danger than you expected to Navigation and escape routes. I mean, this, this just sounds very basic, but how are you going to know where you are? I, I have been with, in the field with so many news crews in particular. It's a hard job, you know. They're working long hours and all the rest of it. They get in the car and basically go to sleep most of the time. Uh, if, they, if the car ran off the road, <laughs> they wouldn't know where they were uh, if they had to phone for help, tell somebody <coughs> to come and get them. Um, they don't know where they're going. People don't read maps anymore. Everything's done on GPS and phones. So navigation, how are you going to know where you are? How are you going to communicate that? How are you going to know where you're going? How do you, how, if, if the situation changes, do you know which way you're going to go to get out? That's all just very basic stuff which often gets overlooked. I've touched on this, which is a t teamwork and a, sh and a shared understanding of the risk and the risk levels that you're, you're willing to take. And typically, you need a culture, you know, uh, I, I've never come across an organization where they haven't had the culture of if people, if, so, if one person in the team is uncomfortable, seriously, and doesn't want to do something, then that's their right, okay? And, and people respect that and they, they pull back. That's a difficult dynamic, you know, when, you've, when you're two weeks into trying to get a good big story and... Uh, Three of the team want to do something, and one of them's feeling unsure about it. You know, how, do, how does that work? But that's important to work to work that out. I think you would back that up, Jared, uh, and that, uh, that uh, goes uh, back uh, to your point about 
completely and teams. I, and, I, and I think talking through, you know, as Paul said, like each step when you're in these hostile environments, like how are we, when are we land, how are we getting from the airport to our secure compound? Um, you know, are we traveling multiple vehicles in a, you know, a convoy? Are they armored? Are they, you know, are they soft cover, or hard cover vehicles? Um, but making sure that every crew, I mean, we can't guarantee safety when you're going to these places. It is a hostile environment. It is unpredictable. And so I think a huge thing is making sure that everyone is, a, is willing to accept those risks. Because what is a huge liability, which I think is what you're kind of getting to, is when you get to those places and somebody who has signed off and then all of a sudden they want out. They just want to get out. Because then when you have to deviate your, and we've had to deal with this, when you have to deviate your plan <laughs> to then get somebody to a place where they can get out of an, of an environment, it puts everyone at a higher risk. So I think it's just, like I said, working with those same crews that have, you know, have that understanding and history with each other is just so, so essential. Um, but certainly, if one person doesn't want to go, typically, they're small crews. I mean, we're not going to send 10 people, 15 people over there. It's usually very, very small nimble where we, where we can blend in and I think I would also add is for us a lot of time we go over to these places and you have somebody who let's say lives in Afghanistan and they say we, we travel like this and you'll be totally safe and a lot of a lot of people would say oh well I trust there whatever they say sounds good but that does and, and I think there's a side of you that wants to say I'm gonna prove to you that I can handle this that I'll be okay and I'm just gonna trust your word I it's it is you should never be afraid to ever say no but we need more we need more we need three cars instead of your one we need armor cars instead of your one that blends into the local environment and trust people like paul that will be the sort of outside voice um to really guide that's just it's just so important uh local assets i mean we touched a, a bit on this but level of trust with local fixers drivers all all, all that kind of thing um local military and militia uh, it was very notable, notable to uh, noticeable to us that during uh, the battle for Mosul last year in Iraq, uh, which was primarily an Iraqi army battle, um, the the level of risk for embedded crews uh, was significantly different to the level of risk if you had been embedded with the U.S. forces or the U.K. forces or French or you know. Um, German or, or whatever. And part of that was because uh, it's a cultural thing, right? They don't, they don't um, uh, have the same level of sense of responsibility for uh, a Western news crew. And, and coupled on that, they, uh, on top of that, coupled with that, they were very keen to uh, show publicly how good they were and how brave they were and how they were taking the fight to ISIS. So lots of news crews, uh, CNN can tell a harrowing story about this, found themselves a long way forward, much further forward than they would have been if they'd been embedded in, in a US unit. You know, a US unit would have said, okay, we'll make sure you can get what you need, but we'll keep you out of the direct, you know, the very front line. A lot of them found themselves cut off um, surrounded, having to be rescued. It was really, it was quite difficult. So my point is, uh, even though you may embed locally with uh, local m militia and, and military units, you need to understand how they're going to, you know, what their level of risk is, what their perception of risk is. A little bit of a, just a side note, there are times when doing scripted things, you may be going to a foreign country and using their local military for transportation, using their units for background, all those types of things. They don't always have the same level of maintenance on their equipment. And there are times when uh, there have been people where helicopters have gone down because of the, the local military not being as good as what we expect in, in uh, more modern countries. Kidnap and detention, this is uh, just you know, an increasingly prevalent problem and um, one which uh, I've had to deal with a number of cases over the years, um, including the kidnap of Alan Johnson, who was our correspondent in Gaza for four months, um, but lots of other lower level uh, kidnaps, detentions, depends you know, how, how, what you want to uh, how you want to describe them. Um, the point about this is it's important organizationally to have your response worked out 
before this happens. I mean, as individuals on the ground, they need to be prepared and equipped and trained. They need to have done all that preparation of having proof of life, code words and DNA or whatever your processes are. Um, but the really important thing about these scenarios is how they're handled, particularly in the first 24 hours. Because there's often a window in the first 24 hours where a little local difficulty can be resolved by a, a, a wiser head, a, you know, a, a, a more sensible person than perhaps the hotheads who have grabbed your crew. And before it gets out, before it becomes an issue, before people are too far down the rabbit hole with it, there's often a, a chance that it can, be, it can be negotiated out. So if your crew go off the, off the radar, as it were, and you lose communications with them and you think, you know, you need to know who you're going to call, who you're going to bring locally to bear on that situation, which politicians you know, which fixers, which people of influence you can lean on to try and get that resolved as quickly as possible. And then, of course, heaven forbid, if it turns into a full-blown thing, how are you going to manage that? But that's a, that's a whole different ballgame. And just to add real quick, is, and I, you touched on this earlier, is trusting your local fixers. You know, and your, and your locals on the ground. We've been in situations where we've been sort of taken, not in Afghanistan, but in other countries, hostage. And allowing that, allowing the system to work out and not, not making it worse by trying to cover it, to film it. Cameras down, keep it simple, let them do their jobs and hopefully it works out. And you just have to let it, and that's been at least my experience, is I think a lot of, our, a lot of people want to say, well, I gotta, I gotta film this, I gotta cover this. And a lot of time that can simply make it so much worse. Um, and so if you find yourself or your crew in a situation like that, um, where there's a potential, a potential incident or conflict, um, whether it's caused by a car accident or whatever that might be, um, let, let the people you've entrusted do the work to get you out of it, trust that. Um, we talked about equipment, but just, just a few big points on this. Some film equipment and your profile, you know, what size of team are you going to send? How is that going to affect you logistically? What kind of profile do you want to present? Uh, as Jared has said, you know, in most cases you want to go as light and as small as possible. Uh, ballistic protection, I've talked about this, other PPE, I won't, I won't labor these points. Um, medical, medical equipment. That's important, but of course is linked to training. I mean, often we send with teams medical equipment which they, them can't, they themselves can't use, but they can give to a medical professional locally. Um, sterile needle kit, giving set, uh, some drugs which probably aren't available locally, etc. cetera. So that, that can be done. Um, there are, uh, well, I don't know what it's like here, but in Europe, it's certainly, uh, there are complications around that. What kind of equipment you give to people, uh, what they're allowed to do, um, the liability and all that kind of stuff needs to be worked out. And uh, chemical, biological, and radiological equipment we've talked about, communications and tracking. Tracking is an interesting uh, thing. It's become quite popular. Lots of productions like the idea that they can be tracked and people will know where they are um, and, and, and often it is extremely useful uh, it, and, and normally with the systems we at least advise people to use or we give them uh, you have the ability to raise an alarm which is helpful uh, of course the, the problem is that they like all technology it doesn't work everywhere and there are lots of places significantly where it's deliberately blocked I think often by U.S. forces, actually. Mm -hmm. But if you go to, for instance, Tripoli, you can't get a tracking satellite signal out of the place. Um, uh, most of Libya is like that. Uh, large parts of Iraq are very difficult to track you. And so you, you just got to be aware of the limitations of, of tracking. And of course, the slight downside with it is that, well, as soon as if you if you do get kidnapped or detained or the first thing they're going to do is search you and smash your tracker, right? That's, they're not going to let you, it, so it only gives you a certain amount of information, but, but quite useful, but they just need to be, it just needs to be thought through. On the communications front, actually we find um, the greatest uh, thing that's happened in the last few years is WhatsApp. 
That's a terrific <laughs> means to easily communicate uh, where, there's, where there's at least a bit of a signal. But of course, in lots of places, there isn't any signal. So you need a satellite phone. Uh, they're difficult to use. You've got to get out your vehicle. You've got to get a line of sight. It's slow. You know, it's, it's quite tricky. So um, some thought needs to go into that. Just a word on, on new things that are happening. Um, uh, one of the things that's happened, particularly in recent years, is that there's less of this kind of stuff gets done by US, UK, Western, if you want to call it that, um, crews. There's an awful lot more gets done locally. Uh, the technology exists, you know, the iPhone, the internet. If you want a picture of Aleppo, you don't send a crew to Aleppo, you go to the Aleppo Media Center, which is a bunch of local volunteers who go out and get you pictures of the fighting, right? If you want pictures out of um, uh, Idlib, you know, which is a big battle going on now. There are no Western crews in there. You get it all locally. But what does that, what, is, what issues does that raise about uh, you know, how you manage their risk, about what liability you're taking for commissioning people to go out and do these things, what equipment you're giving them, if any, what training, if any, they can have. So there's a number of issues uh, about that. That, that need to be look, looked at. What, what, is the, what is the level of responsibility that commissioners should take if you're using these people? Do you ever do this? You probably use lots of locals. Yeah, we just did actually in, in Afghanistan. We, the, yeah. we, had a, we were ready to send three people out there and we, um, the network basically, there was two bombs that went off in Kabul and they said, you know, we don't want to do that anymore. And there's basically two organizations that we've used. We don't use them a lot, but we use them once in a while. And we found two locals um, that we used to film. Um, and it was, you know, I think, yeah, it was nerve wracking in terms of really figuring out. I think when we send crews, it's very clear what we need to do to keep them safe. But when you're talking about locals that are going out, it's definitely a blurred, it's, sure. it, it's a blurry it's line. Very yeah. Um, during the Iraq time, uh, when the BBC made a lot of programs about, uh, about Iraq, uh, I just remember this in particular because it became a real issue. We, we, um, uh, all about the contributor risk, right? What you go, you make a program, you, you interview locals or they, they assist you. What happens when you leave? What situation have you left them in? Um, what, what are the implications of them? Uh, helping, having helped you, being interviewed, what have they said, how do you protect them? And of course, in those days it was all about, well, we'll make sure this program doesn't get seen in these territories. Well, of course, that's out of the window now. <laughs> you can't control the territory, you know, where, where things are shown. Um, so that defense is gone. And certainly, uh, BBC being good, uh, caring, um, you know, moral uh, people, uh, basically got a lot of people out, but we ended up with our own sort of minor immigration crisis in the UK with all these Iraqi contributors that we'd brought back to the UK and were trying to get visas for and one thing or another because they'd all been threatened when we left. Um, so that's a, that's a challenge. The risk profile uh, is just to say, you know, there was a time when uh, journalists in particular, but program makers generally were sort of given some immunity. You know, they were sort of bystanders, they were treated with some respect by warring parties and that kind of thing. Those days are gone. Uh, you're just a propaganda tool now and somebody to put, be put in, a, in lots of places in an orange suit and paraded and you know, abused. So the risk profile is extremely high. And um, a lot of the places that are now you know, the, the most difficult contract, uh, uh, conflict zones, Syria, Yemen, South Sudan, um, those sort of places are are really, really difficult to send to and to work in. Uh, and the other thing is, what about attacks at home? This is, we're talking about different parts of the world, but you know, we have plenty of these sort of high-risk events that happen right here, right? Um, you know, lots of shootings, uh, civil, civil disturbance, etc. Uh, we have our share in um, Europe at the moment as well, lots of terrorist attacks time to time. How do you apply the safety culture to those? Uh, and finally, the other thing that's really, um, uh, really growing is what I've called here the cyber threat. I really mean sort of information security, social media, 
Uh, what do you do about your identities, your online presence, etc., when you go to places where actually something that's completely benign in, in the US or in Europe is not viewed in the same way or could be used against you when you meet up with locals? So that's a whole thought. How do you protect your, um, your information, your communications, your rushes, uh, and all that kind of stuff, which needs thinking about? So, uh, I do have a little, just a very quick, do you want me to do this or have we had enough? So I just wanted to illustrate this with a little case study that um, we did recently. So this is, uh, and I'll just bounce through this because I, I can sense that people are flagging. Um, <laughs> this is Stacey Dooley, who's a UK uh, current affairs reporter, youth skewed. She has done a lot, um, uh, uh, BBC Three, which is an online channel targeted at younger audience. Uh, she did a lot with, uh, in Iraq and ISIS and particular, you'll remember a couple of years ago, the city of Sinjar in the north of Iraq was, uh, ISIS took over and there's a sect there called the Yazidis and they enslaved all the Yazidi women and drove the Yazidi men out, killed a lot of them and a lot of these women ended up in Mosul as slaves to ISIS while ISIS occupied Mosul and then when Mosul was liberated, um, Stacey had done a story about Yazidi women previously with us and then she wanted to go back. She had one of these ladies and they wanted to take her back to where she'd been held, tell her story. Also go out on uh, raids with the Iraqi army into what they suspected ISIS pockets of resistance. They wanted to go to a trial. They wanted to see an execution. So there's quite a lot of good stuff they wanted to do. Mosul had been liberated but was still very difficult. Um, so we worked with them to do this, to do this program. Uh, so the, pro the production company was Insight TWI, I think an American company actually, at the root, um, for BBC Three, uh, Mosul, October 2017. So just quickly what we did. I mean, the approach to this is absolutely starting with the editorial, right? You've got to understand what the story is uh, you know, what, and, and what people need to get to tell that story in, in television terms. Um, so absolutely a discussion about you know, what the story is going to be. And as Jared has mentioned, having a number of branches and redundancy, so we want to, you know, it's quite good on these things to have a number of story plot lines that you can tell because you're not going to get everything. And sometimes you'll get other stuff that you don't, you don't think about. So that sort of thing. Um, then a whole look at, as I've described, you know, what the situation is there, how you can operate, what do you need to do, who you need to be with, who you need to be plugged into, and, and how's that going to work. Then a whole load of, um, you know, what if, what if things go wrong, and let, what are we going to do about it. Bunch of training. So Stacy and her team have, are very experienced, but I think they had a couple of new people. And anyway, as a team, they thought they, they would benefit from doing some training together, so we, we gave them few days of uh, refresher stuff just to get them all up on the same page, which is, I, I would always recommend if your budget can stand it because it's really useful not just for skilling people up, but for getting that sort of common culture going and a baseline of understanding and have all those dis discussions about what if and how, much, how far are we going to go and how are we going to make decisions in a safe environment. Uh, you know, the normal thing is you meet each other at the airport, right? And you all go <laughs> and you work it out on the ground. But if you can possibly carve out some time to do it beforehand, I think it really pays dividends. Um, communication and tracking, which I've spoken about, which we put in place for this. And also in this, in this instance, and w this is not a default se uh, setting by us for it, by any means, we did provide a, a field security guy um, to go with them. My view on that is um, uh, they're great if they add something, right? But they've got to bring some local knowledge, some skill, something that the team doesn't have. Uh, in this case, it was useful because it was a very small team and there was quite a lot of sort of security liaison to be done between the different uh, hosts and parties, um, as well as we had somebody who knew this area really well, had been recently in Mosul, knew his way around, it was been with the Iraqi army and all that kind of stuff, so he, he was a great help. So during, uh, just to bounce through this, obviously, as, as expected and like all these productions, I got there and everything was different. 
and and so you know they had to readjust and so there's a continuous sort of risk assessment what are we going to do what are we going to get uh, and lots of frequent communication about uh, what we were going to do dynamic risk assessment as the plans and situation change it's really the same thing um, and the, important to have an ability, as I've described, to, to adjust for a range of outcomes and, and what's happening. At that time, it was quite a fluid situation. The, uh, uh, the, the Kurds were, the Kurdish forces were getting into a bit of, um, a, bit of a confrontation with the Iraqi army and uh, it wasn't sure exactly what was going to happen, so we needed to make sure we were watching that and, and had our options open. Um, a big feature of all this stuff now is, uh, you know, they like to do all this on social media. It drives, uh, you know, the profile for the program and all that kind of stuff, but you need to manage that carefully. Um, and in fact, I seem to remember one of the one of the factors was that the owner of this production company wanted to go. He's quite a politically controversial figure in the U.S. Actually, he's very anti-Trump, and uh, there was there was uh, quite a lot of local um, uh, concern about that. In the end, he decided against it, which was helpful. But um, uh, that all needs to be managed, and the whole management of not just the team on the ground, but everybody in the UK who, of course, or in this case in the UK, but it, back at base, who, you know, this is, they've got investment in this, they've got a program to produce, there are commitments to be made, and how do you manage that in the decision-making process? And then after, I really only put this up to put a tweet up, because it's, uh, but there you go. Um, hot debrief, important to learn the lessons from these things, especially if you're in a team of doing this. Do you do this, Jared, much, you know, review what's happened when you get back? Sure. It's really, really important. The other thing to look out for is people go on these things. They're quite high octane. They're obviously, you know, high adrenaline. Um, they're fine. They get back. Two days later, they're out. They collapse, right? They've got, you know, the specific sort of fever and flu and one thing and another. So there's often a, a follow-up thing. And at one point we thought they might have sort of got malaria or whatever, but actually they just had the usual thing of being exhausted and run down and having to recover. So that was that was fine. Um, and then we touched on occasionally the sort of the, the post-traumatic uh, elements of this. This is a really key thing and just needs to be recognized and managed. Um, and, you know, some people will need to need some further support and the mechanisms to talk things through or or just get some advice on one thing or another um going back to the point about you know the people left behind who have you interacted with what has it impacted them what do you need to do about that if anything and that's it sorry so um any happy to take any questions or uh, gerard if, if you want to i would just the last thing i would just mention that. just off of the last the last point you made is really communicating with those you're filming like w the, the, where this film will be seen, like where the program will be seen. So they truly know and they can assess their own um, exposure to being part, to taking part of it. And, you know, if we need to offer blur, if we need to offer different things like that, we keep that line of communication open even we're, as we're through the editorial process. Um, because sometimes that situation can change. We can film and then, you know, the program airs um, 10 months later, and the security they felt when we filmed was not, they're no longer there when this airs. So really just making sure you're keeping that communication open and giving them a lot of options um, for their own security. Yeah, and I want to make a point about the debrief. I mean, I think the debriefs are important regardless of what kind of production you're doing. So when you finish a project, it's, it's worth sitting down not only from a safety perspective, but just from an operational perspective and talking things through what went right, what didn't go right, what do we want to change for the next one, and so on and so forth. Um, if you have incidents during the production, the debrief is, is really important. You know, what can we do differently next time so that we don't have the same scenario pop up? Um, so don't just go, it's a wrap, and then get in your car and drive away. 